Good morning, Conquest of Delos. Um, I'm going to do a longish uh, talk this morning, pulling together the Conservative Party leadership election, the touted um, voting pact between the Tories and the Brexit Party, um, and some other things I've been alluding to over the last few months about uh, vote rigging, alliances, um, and the power behind the throne, as it were. Um, now, I'm going to read first this poem, which I sent to my friend David Malone on the day that the Brexit negotiations started, um, which was on the 18th of June, 2017. And it's a poem about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission uh, in April 1996 in South Africa. On the first day, after a few hours of testimony, the Archbishop wept. He put his grey head on the long table of papers and protocols, and he wept. The national and the international cameramen filmed his weeping, his misted glasses, his sobbing shoulders, the call for a recess. It doesn't matter what you thought of the Archbishop before or after, of the settlement, the commission, or what the anthropologists flying in from less studied crimes and sorrows said about his discourse, or how many doctorates, books and installations followed, or even if you think this poem simplifies, lionises, romanticises, mystifies. There was a long table, starched purple vestment, and after a few hours of testimony, the Archbishop, Chair of the Commission, laid down his head and wept. That's how it began. Um, and uh, that then follows with a Wikipedia article on um, someone called Ingrid de Kock. Um, and uh, he is considered to be the most likely assassin of the Swedish Prime Minister, Olaf Palmer. Um, and that assassination will figure in some of these links that I'm just going to go through now. Um, in that, the geopolitics of Sweden, the geopolitics of the, of, of the Cold War, the geopolitics of the Second World War and Swedish neutrality, the geopolitics of the First World War, um, the uh, social contract between states and their peoples, the social contract in Sweden, the social contract post the um, Great Depression in the 1930s, the so-called New Deal. Um, these are all aspects along a long uh, pathway to where we get to today and the actors we see before us uh, on the stage. So this is the landing page of my blog and um, I've gone back to the June 10th blog which I did on Lord Monckton's um, article actually to do with climate change and I asked Lord Monckton because someone else in this uh, discussion about um, Lord Monckton's update on his paper with others uh, on the errors in uh, the global warming, anthropogenic global warming, specifically uh, feedbacks um, and the mathematics of those feedbacks. Um, now Lord Monckton is an interesting person um, and you'll see how he fits in the story as we, as, as we go through. Um, but um, this is uh, that blog. So I asked Lord Monckton to comment on um, the Robin Tilbrook interview with Chaffers and Bray where 
um, Robin Tilbrook sets out the case of the English Democrats um, against the Crown, uh, which contests that Britain has already left the EU on the 29th of March. And um, uh, Lord Monckton's answer is quite interesting. Um, if we just get to it at this blog here, and we'll just read Lord Monckton's response. Um, in response to Mr Lewis, I looked at Tilbrook's pleadings and was unconvinced by them. Um, and he goes on to say why he's unconvinced by them. Um, here's the full here. Unfortunately, attractive though his proposition undoubtedly was, had Parliament not altered the original statute mandating our departure on 29th of March at 11.30pm, with or without a deal, then on that date and time our EU membership would have been an unhappy and very expensive episode in our history. However, Parliament reversed itself, even though, if I remember correctly, it did not do so in a bill, but merely by a resolution. However, once Parliament has spoken, even if it acts in manifest breach of its own rules, which inter alia require that legislation already on the statute book cannot be amended except by subsequent primary legislation enacted by Parliament after all the 11 due stages, the courts will not intervene. Um, well, I don't think that uh, Lord Monckton is, is correct on, on his arguments there, but what is interesting is, is this idea that no deal would be an expensive mistake. Um, and um, Lord Monckton's great-grandfather was the chairman of the Midland Bank, and uh, Lord Monckton knows something about the monetary system, and that's, that's where we're heading with this, 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 uh, this train of thought, which I'm going to take you through here. Um, and Lord Monckton is actually interviewed on uh, the Alex James uh, show uh, in this video here, which is also relevant to what we're going to be discussing. So I shall put these links to this rather long thread of thought in the description to this video um, when I put it up. Um, so hold this one. Hold that thought. Lord Monckton appearing on Alex Jones. Lord Monckton um, being an advisor in the Margaret Thatcher government. Lord Monckton being opposed to Brexit but not opposed to Brexit with a deal, um, and uh, hold that thought. Now, the reason I've been doing quite a lot of digging in all these directions and revisiting quite a lot of what I've read over the last 10 years is my own new internet project, which is a publishing project on Web3. Um, and Web3 is enabled by the blockchain, most people's uh, connection with the blockchain or consciousness of it actually revolves around cryptocurrencies, particularly um, Bitcoin. And more recently, uh, the new uh, Facebook proposed um, blockchain-based cryptocurrency. Um, and again, with Facebook, we're going to encounter, wrapped up in all of these questions, a gentleman by the name of Peter Thiel. Um, so uh, this Web3 and uh, this disintermediation of middlemen and the enablement of creators of wealth um, and the ability for people to ex ex in, um, actually uh, conduct commerce, trade, business, between themselves without an intermediary uh, is, is, is quite an important aspect of, um, of, of, of what uh, conservative thinking calls liberty and libertarianism and what libertarianism really is. Okay, let's 
so um, as I say the links will appear as we go and I will be writing a longer essay on this uh, on this strand of thought this this uh, thread of thought or whatever this process um, and it is an emergent process which uh, has unlocked for me a lot of the different things I know but joined up between a chance comment which uh, uh, Mike Chaffin made in the interview um, not the interview that he may uh, had with Robin Tilbrook that opened up some interesting things in terms of uh, uh, priorities of laws uh, with respect to EU law, British law, but also international law, international private law, etc. And also common law, um, which we will get to again as we go along. So anyway, the Grub Street Journal or Objective Kunz. This is um, the idea of uh, serialised books of Sammy's dat. Um, underground literature which can be both um, factual academic or um, uh, kind of entertainment type literature um, so Mr. Farage replied, I would do a deal with the devil to get a proper Brexit, the secret city and the three city state. So here we are, we're going to cut to the chase. Um, this is the article here, which uh, I read this morning. It's, uh, it was published on the 16th of June, but I, I only noticed it this morning. Um, and uh, exclusive Conservative donors opened secret talks with Nigel Farage on general election pact to save Brexit. Now. The interesting thing about uh, this, and I, as I said, I've done done a blog on it. Um, uh, obviously, this was before the final two in the race were um, confirmed, which is uh, Boris Johnson and uh, Jeremy Hunt. And I think what is quite clear is that Boris Johnson and Nigel Farage are being funded by what I call the Oceana side of the argument and Mr Hunt is kind of the British establishment deep state uh, EU side of the argument which is the Eurasia argument and this um, disjoint in the British establishment as to whether or not to be part of um, the North America free trade agreement or to be part of the um, transatlantic uh, trade um, agreement uh, has been on the table since back in the 1950s um, through the early 1970s um, and into the overt uh, acceptance and, uh, and use of neoliberalism as an ideology um, from Reagan and Thatcher through to the real acceleration of that with, 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 with the election of Bill Clinton. Um, in a similar, we're, we're a similar juncture really to when Jimmy Carter became president. Um, if you remember, he, 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 I think he had one term before Reagan. Um, so that would be 76 to 1980. Um, and, uh, he succeeded Gerald Ford and I think Ford came after the Watergate scandal um, and these things are all kind of relevant to the machinations behind the scene and the um, the global oligarchy if you like, like getting their pawns in place uh, to get a return back to overt feudalism and so when someone like um, uh, Hayek wrote The Road to Serfdom, um, there's a lot of truth, I think, in what Hayek wrote. But the underlying ideologies in Hayek, I think, are accepted by people 
like Steve Baker, who backed Boris Johnson, like um, Nigel Farage. Um, and then the flip side to that, the people in opposition to them, the, the Eurocrats, if you like, they subscribe to a different uh, type of uh, feudalism or serfdom, which is more along the German model of um, the three classes, i.e. the nobility, uh, the uh, middle class, or the uh, technical class, and then the rest, the underclass, really, um, which we see as the precariat in the current model. Um, and there's this uh, current tug of war, really, between the two camps, and Britain is very much stuck in the middle, um, uh, again, in a very steeler's wheel kind of way. Um, fools to the right of me, jokers to the left of me, jokers to the right, stuck in the middle. And, um, and uh, Boris Johnson is, uh, is the joker, I guess. And um, Jeremy Hunt is the fool. Nigel Farage is the joker. And, say, Tom Watson is the fool. Um, Jeremy Corbyn kind of doesn't fit into this story. I mean, he's kind of stick, stuck in the middle as well <laughs> um, with, 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 with his own sort of ideologies and all the rest of it. Um, and uh, if you're interested in direct democracy like I am, and true liberty and the truer sense of conservatism, then uh, you find yourself rejecting all of these things, including liberalism. And we'll, we'll, we'll come to liberalism as well in, in America window coming up. So here, I, I searched my blog for this term, 50 years behind hand. Now that's a quote from a famous uh, speech given by Edmund Burke in the Houses of Commons um, and I'm just going to the next window should actually be the full quote uh, where is it Let's... that's something else let's just uh, we'll get to there in a minute Right. Okay. Uh, I'll try not to open and close windows because there's so much open. Um, so 50 years behind and... That's the blog I did back in January. Um, but the speech um, on these present discontents, I'm quite fond of quoting, and it's reproduced in full elsewhere on the blog. Let's just wait for this to come up. And here's the extract here. So. It is very rare indeed for men to be wrong in their feelings concerning public misconduct, as rare to be right in their speculation upon the cause of it. I have constantly observed that the generality of people are fifty years at least behindhand in their politics. There are but very few who are capable of comparing and digesting what passes before their eyes at different times and occasions, so as to form the whole into a distinct system. But in books, everything is settled for them without the exertion of any considerable diligence or sagacity. For which reason men are wise with but little reflection and good with little self-denial in the business of all times except their own. We are very uncorrupt and tolerably enlightened judges of the transactions of past ages where no passions deceive and where the whole train of circumstances from the trifling cause to the tragical event is set in an ordinary series before us. 
few are the partisans of departed ty tyranny, and to be a Whig on the business of a hundred years ago is very consistent with every advantage of present civility. This retrospective wisdom and historical patriotism are things of wonderful convenience and serve admirably to reconcile the old quarrel between speculation and practice. Many a stern Republican, after gorging himself with a full feast of admiration of the Grecian commonwealths and of our true Saxon constitution, and discharging all the splendid bile of his virtuous indignation of King John and King James, sits down perfectly satisfied to the coarsest word and homeliest job of the day he lives in. I believe there was no professed admirer of Henry VIII among the instruments of the last King James, nor in the court of Henry VIII was there, I dare say, to be found a single advocate for the favourites of Richard II. And so this was the blog post then that I did on June the 18th, in which I said, um, it's who you know and what you believe that counts. Um, and it talks about semi-establishment Pelagianism and, um, and, 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 and uh, talks about Occam's Razia and this idea of cabotage and flying flags of convenience. Um, now, cabotage is the transfer of goods in coastal waters of nations by uh, shipping under a flag of convenience. Um, and if you think of our politicians as um, shipping political solutions um, within our borders, but under foreign flags of convenience, uh, there are two flags of convenience here. There's the United States flag, and then there's the European Union super state flag. Um, and they both have slightly different ways of getting you to accept and enjoy your own slavery. I mean, that's effectively, um, it's a very elitist ideology, and it's the ideology of um, feudalism. And Alex Thompson, in his uh, talk at the, um, I think it was Alternative View 8 conference, absolutely nailed this uh, with a quote from Lord Glassman in a film uh, about the City of London, um, which was done with partial funding from the University of Roehampton. So well done them. Uh, and um, we'll be coming to Alex's stuff a, a bit, bit later. But this talks about the flag of convenience actually being um, the uh, flag of political correctness, as defined by Professor Bruce Charlton in his book Thought Prison PC, which this blog then goes into. So I'll put the link in the... Uh, in, in, in the uh, thing there, um, but the two camps basically split into the same two camps um, that emerged arguing over uh, the course of the, the Christian Church, the Church of Rome and the Church of Constantinople in the schism between those two uh, religious power structures. and. Uh, on the one hand, the Church of Rome had a centralised oligarch, really, a tyrant, really. Uh, in the Eastern Orthodox Church, they had a kind of a federated oligarchy of, uh, uh, of local tyrants. Um, and so if you think in terms of divine rights of kings um, and predestination, chosenness, and those types of ideas, um, which I argue is the uh, Oceana way of doing things um, and then the other people who believe more in free will um, and a more federated way of doing things and a first among equals way of doing things that's more the EU way of doing things and I, I by my own 
um, political uh, tastes, if you like, reject both of those approaches. Um, and there is a, an approach which is actually um, one which is set out by G.K. Testson and Hilaire Belloc, uh, and it's known as dist distributism, and names like Henry George uh, are associated with that way of doing things. Um, and monetary reform, which comes to the heart of, of this, and the blog which I've done this morning, um, become very relevant to this. Um, and where Dominic Cummings stands in all of these questions, um, I'm not really sure, but it doesn't really matter because he's such a clear thinker that he sets out all sides of an argument um, and then based upon that will um, you know, act accordingly, which is why he's so dismissive of the um, Whitehall machinery of bureaucracy, for instance, and of the crop of politicians um, which we have um, and are inflicted upon us. Um, but as I say, these are pawns in this larger game um, uh, between two camps in an oligarchy, one that want a single tyrant and others that want a, uh, a, a series of feudal lords, if you want. And that's, that's, that's the choice between these two things. And I say we should reject both of those things and go for uh, a proper democratic um, ideal such as was envisioned by people like the Chartist movement in, in, in Britain. Um, or indeed the Founding Fathers of the United States with a couple of extra steps um, you know, regarding the pursuit of happiness and what have you. Um, uh, and so this is more monetary theory stuff so I'm going to put that in there and in the interest of keeping this relatively short um, the, these are s steps along the way to getting to what I'll be wrapping up with with my conclusion and I'll just pick out points as we go. Uh, and what's this one? Social condition, conventional parties, conspiracy, hypothesis theory, scads. Yeah. W when when you get into um, these questions, it's not long before you get uh, accused of being a conspiracy theorist or whatever. Um, the antidote for that, for me, the best thing is, is um, there's a philosopher in New Zealand by the name of Pigeon who wrote a um, a plain verse poem based on Coriolanus um, and uh, in answer to two academics who had accused or accepted the very notion of such a thing as a conspiracy theory um, but uh, yeah, climate change comes into this as well. 97% of practicing mediums agree that communication with the dead is real. Settled seance. Um, I won't say any more than that. You'll figure out which side of the argument I fall on that. So here's the 50 years behind hand, and I thought this Radio Free uh, Europe um, thing was, was very uh, interesting, and that's the quote which I read a little while ago about the 50 years behind and from these present discontents. Moving along, um, Labour's right wing draws up new plan to undermine Jeremy Corbyn um, in denial on the paradigm shift. Uh, so I did a paradigm shift uh, um, question um, and uh, here we are, this one on Brexit here, one of my lengthier Brexit posts. Uh, probably just worth visiting at this uh, juncture as we develop the, um, develop the thesis here, the hypothesis that, that we're, we're working towards regarding uh, Mr. Farage and uh, Mr. Boris Johnson. 
Um, and my thesis in this, or hypothesis in this post, was that uh, Brexit is not being seen for what it is, uh, a post-globalisation tremor uh, of the paradigm shift in political economy. Um, and I go through uh, various reasons why, why I think that my process it just isn't man enough for the job for this at this present stage so I'm going to start closing some of these windows as we go along because uh, right there's an excellent article which John Cook wrote about why the establishment is so worried about Jeremy Corbyn and it talks about Thomas Kuhn and uh, uh, when a paradigm shift happens um, how old discredited ideas hang on for some while um, there's lots to sort of unpack from that as it concerns um, well I guess Jeremy Corbyn's Trotskyism really um, and that's what he really is an old trot rather than a sort of a, like a, a, a Marxist Leninist or even a, a, a Stalinist I think he's a Trotskyist, which is a kind of an idealist type of um, internationalist communist, if you like. Um, with uh, John MacDonald, I suspect he's more of a Marxist-Leninist than a Trot, to be honest. Um, one of the best people to go to to find out about what these ideologies mean to the people that adopt them is really I, I i claim peter hitchens peter hitchens who himself used to be a trot uh, that's a trotskyist um uh, kind of understands you know the good place that that that, that people who get into it come from um, and then the dubious methods by which because they're so convinced of their own righteousness that they're prepared to adopt to sort of implement these things um and uh the other good person to read about that is Bakunin. Bakunin and Marx hated each other. And on my blog here, there's a quote from Bakunin in, in the uh, top left there, which is talking about uh, the dictatorship of the proletariat and that any dictatorship only begets more uh, dictatorships. Um, so, you know, Marx didn't take kindly to Bakunin's uh, pointing this out. These are two monetary quizzes that I put together. Um, both based on work by Positive Money. Positive Money have been hijacked by the green fascist movement now, uh, but nonetheless this quiz by David Faraday is worth doing. Um, the answers come up as you go along and uh, it, it's, it's an informative uh, thing to do. So the link is in, in the blog I did this morning and will be in the link for this video. And then we come to the idea of the federated pound sterling, Gordon Brown's idea about federating sterling, the idea of dual cur uh, currencies which um, Yanis Varoufakis put forward for Greece. And with Varoufakis, um, I think he's on the gold bug side of all of this. He's aligned with a guy in America, the son, the son of um, the famous... Uh, economist G.K. Galbraith. Well, his son is also a professor of economics and he and uh, uh, Varoufakis were on a faculty together in America and uh, the M25 and their solutions, which are slightly different to the MMT Green New Deal type solutions that the Green Parties are pushing for. Um, but I think you'll find that Varoufakis is more on the side of the Oceana, in my view, uh, or an Oceana type way of doing things as opposed to the MMTers who are um, more a Soviet style of, of, of to the approach and that effectively the EU is the EUSSR it's a very Soviet centralized planned way of doing things with with federated vassal states um, which is why they don't like people like Viktor Orban and why they absolutely hated Vaclav Klaus, and Vaclav Klaus is someone you should listen to. Um, he, he's an amazing man, um, and is, as I say, completely crowded out of the ongoing narrative, simply because he spoke so much sense. Uh, going forward, okay, now, what happened there? Paradigm 
I shit, that's a song I wrote. A new paradigm. The window that was before that, that just closed, is uh, actually the one that I want. So I'm just going to get that up here. There we are. Just like a no, it's going to re-enter at the end. Boom, boom. This was a community-based complementary currency, which I um, did a lot of work in proposing. Um, and it talks about this heuristics in historical time, minor monetary arrangements, um, Thomas Malfin's uh, paper, a uh, very interesting paper, um, which talks about uh, uh, currencies like the Dernier um, and uh, this uh, learning monetary history in North and Baltic Sea region, etc. Um, very much worth reading for seeing how you can do commerce without usury. And then at the end of this slideshow, which I put together for some of my um, investment partners, um, there's another article which is on the Bonmaisi's blog, or Bonmaisi's wire, Trade as Good as Gold or How the Hanseatic League Thrived Without Debt. Now, this is gold, this is silver. Um, there's another blog that I did called Meet the Fuggers, um, and the, the Fuggers are still in European society. Um, and uh, uh, they had the monopoly on the Tyrolean um, silver mines, uh, which allowed them to uh, actually end up ex controlling the exchequer of large parts of Bavaria, and etc. Um, now, uh, let's just get back to where we were here. Uh, on the present discontents, so there's a whole bunch of uh, my sort of quoting from Edmund Burke in these different uh, uh, different facets of, of arguments that he makes in that classic speech. Uh, the Federated Pound Sterling makes another appearance in some of my later thoughts regarding Gordon Brown's suggestion of the Federated Currency and how that would fit, fit in with a kind of a, uh, a complete castration of the British Constitution, uh, whilst on the face of it appearing to maintain the usury, uh, but, but selling out really completely to um, European vassalage. Um, here's the Meet the Fuggers uh, post which I did, which quotes extensively from Professor Richard Werner, who's another very good source and a trusted source for me on um, matters um, local banking and uh, monetary matters. Um, I haven't got a clue what Richard's politics are and frankly don't care. I mean, it, it, um, the politics side of all of this, um, I, I mean, I think people should argue that out with all the facts and uh, for myself, personally speaking, I just want to be left alone. <laughs> you know, I don't really want to interfere. I mean, this stuff is... Um, yeah, I want to say it comes from a place of love. I'm not criticising anyone. I'm sure everybody on all sides thinks they're right, and it comes from their own, uh, you know, fr fr from the information they have available to them and how it affects themselves. Uh, in a wider context, um, if people would stop shouting at each other just for five minutes, they might find out that uh, actually just going back to this this little thing, let me just. Uh, as I'm making this point, just point out this this little diagram here. Um, this is uh, four quadrants classifying domains of knowledge, and uh, this is from a Bernard Latier paper, which was is called Integral Ma uh, Money, which applies this model um, to understanding political co economy and how money fits into that uh, with, with with a more um, many faceted, a more um, layered approach. Um, I'm quite fond of the giant concept of uh, Sakyanata, or whatever it's called, I can't pronounce it properly, um, but, but this basically says that um, you know, with each level of understanding you see from a different perspective, you know, 
on this predicate this conclusion on this predicate not this conclusion this predicate this conclusion cannot be and it, so it goes on there are about seven of them similarly my Ammonides in the um, uh, guide for the perplexed talks about uh, levels of contradiction which appear in uh, esoteric texts and again he goes through about seven different levels of um, contradiction uh, why and how they're not always um, accidental um, in fact the most um, crude form of contradiction is actually the accidental one uh, so according to my Maimonides and I agree with him uh, so here's meet the fuggers um, this is a long post I did um, quote from Confucius the beginning of wisdom is to call things by their proper name um, very true it's on Neumann's elephant which is basically lies down lies and statistics and this is uh, Freeman Dyson is fond of this story and I, I downloaded the code and sort of made an animated thing of it no, no one has done it but this blog yeah, has quotes to all that but he, here we have look um, this this guy on Twitter had, had basically um, I think he's the guy that put the code up there and I think it's in Python and I but whatever I made a little video here which shows shows how by shifting variables you can indeed as von Neumann said by adding a fourth variable you can make not only an elephant but you can make its trunk wiggle uh, which sure enough here we go hopefully they're making the trunk wriggle on what's really behind this uh, brino notion there he goes <laughs> anyway that's a bit nerdy but hey such is life um, next up so two th thoughts on the castration of Odin on the new sexual consent law in Sweden now this is from a blog that I discovered as part of this train of um, thought um, and uh, we come down through here it's Michael Kowalik I, I, sorry Michael, I can't, I, 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 I've never heard your name pronounced, so Kowalik I, it would be until um, I find out otherwise. Um, but Michael is interested in value theory, the monetary system, he's interested in cryptocurrencies, he's interested in uh, feminism as a politically correct um, uh, sort of fe feminazism type of thing. Um, and uh, pulled together, along with Mike Chaffin of Chaffers and Bray, several aspects of uh, how liberty, freedom of speech and freedom of thought is being constrained to kind of shoehorn in this, uh, uh, this, this sort of feudalism which atomizes all the serfs so that they all hate each other or you know, um, are very isolated in their own uh, uniqueness and um, the Michael did a, 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 a blog about what makes me me I haven't linked to it in these things but I did read it uh, and this idea of meanness and otherness um, and uh, it's a very persuasive argument now I I'm a great fan of the essay by Osho which is called Ego the False Sense uh, Center and uh, in terms of meanness and the self uh, that essay by Osho for me I, I read it probably about eight years ago and that helped a lot of pennies drop for me especially in understanding ego projection and um, uh, the, I'm a poet and so poetically the best expression of it for me is Burns's poem about uh, oh, what a gift a gift to give us uh, to see each other as others see us 
um, which is on a Laos, on, a, on seeing a Laos of a lady in, in church, and it, it's a beautiful poem, you'll find it on the blog, um, and uh, that's what this kind of all comes down to in terms of, you know, the age-old uh, technique of tyrannical government, which is to divide and rule, or divide and conquer. Um, and that's what's happening to us folks. Um, and the Brexit uh, bedwetting, which goes on on both sides, it's really best to stop because um, uh, you're arguing with each other and meanwhile you're being played, you know, and uh, Johnny Rotten famously said in the Sex Pistols last, uh, last concert, at some point they're going to turn around and say, you know, um, did you ever feel you've been had? Um, so, here we are, uh, hence this video, which, um, as I say, I'm, I'm very fond of links and videos and sources and what have you. Um, the other day I spent several hours hunting for an Alan Watt clip. I recognised his voice, recognised his face, but I couldn't remember his name. Um, I'll remember it now forever because I remembered when I first came across him, it was like Alan Watts, who's another famous philosopher. Uh, and Alan Watts uh, is much more widely known than Alan Watt, but Alan Watt is uh, a very persuasive um, commentator on these things. Um, how that the most well-known interviews uh, with him are actually done by Alex Jones in Infowars, and so how that all fits in with um, what Alex Jones's agenda is, um, he says it's Americana and you know, um, you know, love of God and people, and, and I, I don't, I don't doubt Alex Jones on that, but I do think that he thinks the way to achieve that is through the gold standard and this information, which is going into this video about Nigel Farage and so forth, and Boris Johnson and how all that fits in to all of this, and Peter Thiel and all this, um, is. Uh, what is the motivation behind the, uh, the recommendations um, or conclusions that are being recommended um, by different, different people? Um, and it's only really by understanding those we can decide who we think is right. You know? Do we think Nick Clegg is right? Do we think Tony Blair is right? Do we think Boris Johnson is right? Nigel Farage is right? Donald Trump is right. And I've got to say, with all of these people, Donald Trump is the one that I... I don't think it's the, the same sort of hope or delusion I held for Obama when he first got elected. Kind of thing, yeah, oh, right, eventually we might have someone who cares. It turned out not to be the case. Uh, um, and so I was very careful to guard against that with, with Donald Trump. But there's a speech on a website we're going to come to a bit later, which uh, I've, got, I've got to say, sort of, you know... Um, put it this way, I wouldn't want to m walk a mile in Donald Trump's shoes, I really wouldn't, or Nigel Farage's, or Boris Johnson's for that matter, I mean, I, you know, they, they uh, for whatever reasons, that they, they, they find themselves in those boots, um, you certainly wouldn't find me volunteering to jump into them, I, I must confess. Uh, so that's Grub Street, and that's another search, that's the front page of the blog here. Uh, okay, I've done two other blogs on that since then, so if we just refresh that and see where we're up to. Control files. If you look at what I've done over the last month, it draws back on, I've been blogging since 2011, and it draws back on all of that. Um, and I first got, I, I watched a Zeitgeist movie, I think in 2009, someone came to a party in my house in England, um, and just casually said to me, oh, well, of course you do know that 9-11 was an inside job, um, and at that point it hadn't even really occurred to me. Um, I mean, I'm a, uh, a chartered surveyor, so I know something about buildings, and I, I must say I 
I thought it looked like a controlled demolition, but that um, didn't really pay it much attention. And then the Iraq war and all this sort of thing that came afterwards, I, I wasn't paying much attention. Um, I remember when there was a big march, I, 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 uh, I, I was always in the habit of driving into central London, and I, I can remember thinking that day oh, how inconvenient it was not, not to be able to drive and get in the tube um, because all of these people were protesting, and I, I really didn't know I'm gonna say that then uh, what they were, you know, what they were really protesting there, or what they thought they'd achieve by doing that. Now I do, uh, and I wish I'd been, you know, more aware back then. Um, and you know, that that's uh, in all of our lives, we all have different uh, priorities and different preoccupations at different times. Um, so anyway. So yeah, this update is unspeakable cause of Brexit, uh, which is on the blog of the guy that all the way back in 2012, I, I, I uh, he did a blog on uh, a guide to arguing, or the idiot's guide to arguing with bankers about the financial crisis, which is brilliant. I think he's now based in Brazil. I sent him a note today because I've commented on his blog several times on that one but I decided to read read some more and that was written at the time of it, and it's a very interesting point um, so let's uh, just keep going through Chaffers and Bray this is my my long chat with Chaffers and Bray which I've done these word clouds for for the sorts of things we cover with um, and these two have been instrumental in bringing together they've, they've been the glue in quite a lot of different ideas I had which I didn't quite know who f how they fitted together um, and the Brexit party and Nigel Farage uh, they've been able to be because they were UKIP activists and they were vote leave activists um, they were aware of UKIP the 2015 successes, the 2017 letdown, and then also the processes by which uh, Vote Leave under Dominic Cummings um, managed to pull together a coherent campaign which Aaron Banks and Nigel Farage, with their style of management, were really unable to do. Um, and uh, by studying Dominic Cummings in depth, over the last week or so, um, you know, I've read the large part of his blog and I've watched all his evidence to the Treasury Committee on leaving the EU, EU etc. Um, I must say I'm hugely impressed by Dominic Cummings' thought and uh, um, you know, uh, yeah. So that that's um, that's that blog there. Um, and this is the talk with Robin Tilbrook about whether we have actually already left the EU. You know, basically whether in their rush to keep us out they, they've screwed up legally and whether that is something where a truly sovereign Brexiteer could actually say, well, Parliament as you stand, you know, there's been a fuck up. You're going to have to talk to Theresa May about that and, and, and to uh, Mark Sedwell and all those other guys because uh, you know, the court case is right and, and we're going to concede the court case and that's it and then get on with negotiating a trade deal with the EU or the US and if the real cleavage here is between uh, Oceania and Eurasia and then the real zealots who actually want to do away with uh, Oceania and um, Eurasia and have total world dominance under one tyrant uh, they're in, you, you, you get the idea. Um, I think Tony Blair sees himself as the heir apparent to the Emperor of the Earth and Tyrant Supreme, um, you know, giving his advice to the uh, psychopathic uh, monarch or, or, or princeling, I don't know if he's succeeded yet, but, but you know, the guy that killed the uh, Adnan Khashoggi's nephew, you know, the journalist. And again, you know, if you know who Adnan Kagoshi was, uh, it's really quite extraordinary 
on the one hand and not on the other that his nephew should be um, basically murdered uh, for political means and for saying the wrong thing. Um, but anyway, I digress. Um, an idiot's guide to argue with bankers. So this is uh, Matthew Arthur and Richmond, and there's his blog um, and the quote there, uh, which again is another jig piece of the jigsaw puzzle in terms of narrative. The narrative's going all the way back to. Um, Secret Rulers of the World by John Ronson, for instance. Uh, I mean, there's a Staring at Goats is a, a blog that I did about um, when Donald Trump came to uh, power and, and, and when Rex Tillerson was kind of in the mix still. Um, so, um, where are we? They would not dance, would not follow me. This is the religious side of things. I, um, the idea of orthodoxy and centralised faith, organised religion and uh, orthodox faith, including paganism <laughs> and the idea that um, power structures will obviously try to co-op churches because uh, uh, again when it comes to the self and otherness aspects of, of being and meaning um, and love, love being far and away the most important emotion that there is. Um, and the attempts to deny love and to give it a mechanistic um, thing, denying free will and, 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 and the idea of, of, of karma, soul, call it what you will, um, but uh, that, that connection that, I mean musicians know the connection, when, when, when something is channeled channeled in a, a live performance, a, a live communion between people um, and uh, you know, that, that, you know um, the, awe, the awe that we all feel in the presence of say a, a, a piece of beautiful art or a wonderfully moving piece of music, uh, a, a beautiful poem, um, a choice phrase, uh, you know, a, a, a sound, a, a smell all of these things where, where um, that, that bring people together and, and recognize our shared experiences um, and it's that experiential side of things and the interpretation of our experiences and our being able to communicate them with one another that cause us to have empathy uh, for things like us which is why uh, Michael Koalik's thing uh, blog on that. I, I wanted to revisit that because it's quite profound. Um, I mean it's also known as things like the subject-object dichotomy in, uh, in philosophy. But, but um, as I say, I, mean, I think Osho and Michael Krolik, his, his, you know, his, his piece on that um, for me is redolent of, of, of the sorts of insights that Osho offers, um, which is a compliment. Right. They would not dance and they would not follow me. This is my, I'm going to read this. My thesis in this post is that religious orthodoxy as opposed to religious conformism are two separate things and orthodox traditions have more to agree upon than conformist traditions. I use conformist in the sense of conforming to the strictures of a branch or school of thought within an overarching religious state or political structure. That applies to Brexit, applies to um, political economy, it applies to religion, it applies to um, nationalism to a certain extent, um, so, uh, it, and localism, so yeah, I mean it's summed up in terms of birds of a feather fly together. Uh, so that's that one, go into the description, yeah, what have we got here? So, and it's, which leads me to today's blog, and Mr. Farage replied, I would do a deal with the devil to get a proper Brexit, the secret city, the three city states. So, here's the uh, Daily Telegraph, um, 16th of June article, um, where uh, Rory Stewart is interviewed by Farage, uh, and... Um, 
there's this exchange between them. We need to find a way as a part of reaching out to you and bring you in to try and work out how we crack this, how we get this uh, Brexit through Parliament. I, I, I mean, I, I personally find Rory Stewart kind of clueless. Um, he's, I think he's autistic as, as a, 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 in respect to actually hearing other people's points of view. I mean, you can see him struggle, struggling with allowing other people to put a point of view uh, in that debate, the one which Boris appeared in. Um, so, uh, so here's my thesis now. Um, I would do a deal with the devil to get a proper Brexit, and then I said another elitist stitch-up of the people and our democracy. Farage says he will do a deal with the devil to get Brexit. The devil's Brexit in the Marmite Farage plan is a unipolar one, world government under UN w with a USA dictator. The other devil's Brexit, which is also the remaining in the UK scenario, a sort of Ramona Brino Brexit Smegzit, is a multipolar New World Order under UN, NATO, Atlantic Council auspices but with more federated distributed power, feudalism with federal feudal laws. First among equals rather than outright tyranny of the divine right of the US Emperor. Alex Thompson introduces a clip from Lord Glasson explaining the realities of state monopoly, financialised capitalism and feudalism. Uh, and then there's this absolutely brilliant lecture which uh, Alex gives at Alternative View 9 on the Ian R. Crane channel. Um, and Alex mentions this film, The Secret City uh, film, which the clip uh, which that opens to. And then here's a trailer for The Secret City. I haven't found a full version of the film yet. I, I will find it and I will uh, see to it that it gets up on my um, BitChute channel um, under the nom de plume of uh, uh, Tone Freaks. And, uh, then through this, I came across this just mind-blowing, mind-boggling, unspeakably, amazingly presented uh, clarity of thought, the technocratic tyranny.com. Okay, and uh, this blog is remarkable in that all that I've just been talking about, it all seems to be in there. Um, and uh, so I've, I've done links to that website which is a computer program called Vicky Davis did it and at the bottom of the blog I've put in some other things um, which are really uh, all really very helpful but this particularly is very moving and uh, Vicky uh, had a friend and colleague uh, who committed suicide um, and uh, so side note when I first started researching this subject a young programmer committed suicide because he was replaced in his job. Insult to injury, he had to train his replacement. That story hurt my heart because Kevin was a young man who did everything right. He made it through school, he went to college and he got his first job as a programmer at the Bank of America. He loved his job and he was at the beginning of a life filled with promise. The American dream, but the corporate traitor elite blew up his life in favour of cheap imported commodity labour. Um, and then uh, there are links to where this all sort of stems from, uh, which is a technocratic uh, corporate elite. Um, and so then there's the NAFTA origins and how Britain was originally supposed to be a NAFTA, but basically was told to be a good, uh, a good vassal and, and be on the EU side of the fence, probably on the basis that they'll do more good on the inside than on the outside. There's a very famous um, Yes Minister sketch actually on that very point. Um, and so it goes on. So Oceania or Eurasia, the true choice all along. Um, I'm, and really, uh, then we come to the next blog on this train of thought, the, the one that I did this morning which then eventually pulls that uh, together. Let me just get to it. So this is Eurasia and the idea of, uh, in uh, 1984, the Orwell novel, uh, this map here shows Eura uh, Eurasia and 
Oceano, etc. Um, so you get a bit more on that background. Brexit Oceano area of the game. Uh, this is about the Tilbrook case uh, and how Gina Miller had indeed done us all a favour. Um, and here we go. So it's the monetary sovereignty stupid. Farage Bojo, Trump, Alex Jones and Ron Paul walk into a bar. Uh, the task for today is to make up a punchline for that. So this slide show, um, shows Alex and Ron Paul and Nigel. Um, this is Nigel being interviewed on Alex Jones back in 2010. Here's a reporter at a Brexit party conference asking him to comment on appearing on the Alex Jones show. Uh, and then in this blog, Liberty Revival, um, it's basically saying a plague on all your houses. You just want a gold standard. And people that really understand how money works as a um, institutional finance level, um, the, the fact is that a gold standard is still um, controlling the credit of a nation. Um, it's what people call fractional reverse, reserve banking. It's a little bit more than, than that. Um, but there's a discussion at the end of this article, which I pulled off the uh, internet archive, the Wayback Machine. Um, and uh, then there are all these comments. Okay, And then to come full circle, uh, you get to Peter Thiel and Facebook and the fa Facebook new cryptocurrency, the gold standard, then you factor into that carbon trading. And so, you know, you get the carbon trading people and you get the real hard money people. Um, hard money as in gold, commodity money as in gold and silver. Um, the demonetization of silver, you end up going back to the crime of 1873 and the demonetization of silver in the USA. You get into the story of the three American central banks, the, you know, ending with the Fed in 1913 and Jekyll Island, etc. Um, a lot of these themes and um, storylines are in um, Carol Quigley's Tragedy and Hope, so you can read that book and, and, and sort of get them. But there's more to it than Carol Quigley actually put in Tragedy and Hope, not least because that book was published in 1969. Um, uh, part of the reason he published it then was they felt it was game over and so it didn't matter if the secret was out um, and uh, this video this post and certainly these other websites that I've linked to um, bring it up to date from Quigley's time in 69 so I mean that's uh, it's nearly 50 years ago and so there you have it um, Perhaps, well, no, perhaps about it, Edmund Burke was right 50 years behindhand, and really then maybe start to see where it all started. And we can look at what was started 50 years ago um, and start drawing conclusions about what is now reality. Um, so I'm going to just uh, stop that here. If you listened this far, uh, you know. I hope you enjoyed it. If not, um, I'm sorry to have wasted your time. Right.